So has anyone worked with um, uh, TensorFlow or uh, what's Keras? Or what's what's the other one? Pardon? Keras and TFLearn. Um, machine learning, right? Yeah, from machine like learning, high, TensorFlow high, and high Yeah, I work with Keras. Oh, Keras, yeah. Yeah, and TF Learn and TensorFlow a little bit. That I, I think really would be um, a good uh, a good topic for uh, a presentation. I know that I see these like uh, two minute papers, and so they show how um, they're uh, doing this kind of a deep fake where they take an actor providing motion and then they merge the, the motion onto the image, and then the image, the, the still image becomes a, a moving video. Um, That's two minute papers on YouTube. Uh, two minute papers uh, is a survey. It's some oh. some Russian guy who's like uh, he puts out a. Watch all those. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it's really good. So this one is. Um, I, I found one guy who did a video where it's kind of like here's how you can you can reproduce this in like ten minutes. I need to to go through that. I think that would. That would definitely make for a good uh, demo. Um, seeing seeing the stuff that you're seeing, you know, on YouTube and talking about, you know, frontiers of AI and and actually uh, actually doing it. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's about time we get started. Uh, I don't know how many more people we're going to get in here at this point. So uh, now is as good a time as any. Uh, I apologize to anyone who had any trouble getting in here um, on the YouTube video because uh, you're not here. Sorry about that. All right. So, oh, no. How do I switch my freaking slides here? Come on now. Why can't I switch my slides? Okay. Well, that'll be good enough, I suppose. Oh, I can let's try it again. How do I not show the net? Oh, slide only. Nope. Okay, Snafu. Here we go. All right, guys. Welcome to last month's uh, SACFI. It's actually October 8th. Sorry about the slides. Uh, all right, so Code of Conduct. Our meetup group is, de is dedicated to providing a harassment-free community experience for everyone, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion, or lack thereof. We do not tolerate harassment of our community members in any form. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any venue, including talks, workshops, parties, Twitter, and other online media. Community members violating these rules may be sanctioned or expelled from the community at the discretion of the community organizers. So far, everyone's kind of doing great on that. So, yeah. Uh, all right. All right, guys. Uh, so we got some chat channels. Uh, if you're not in either of them yet, we welcome you to join now. Uh, you can I can put links in the thing, but if you've got your cell phone close, now's a good time to pull out the camera and hit those QR codes. Um, I'll give you guys a few minutes. Is there anyone who wants a little extra time to do that? Does anyone not have those links that wants them? I'll give you a few more minutes. But anyway, uh, you'll find us on Slack. Uh, Sac Tech is a company out of Sacramento that hosts a com community for uh, Sacramento-based technologists. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, we, we currently run our event exactly at the same time as another Sac Tech group. So there's talk of 
potentially moving that in the future. Uh, let's talk about that more in the, the chat channel just to see what uh, people's tastes are. But I, I think uh, there's a lot of people that go to an a AWS meetup through SACTEC that may want to show up at Python. And well, they're a little big group. So maybe we move either first or third month, Thursday of the month. Is there anyone who's got any particular objections to a move? Like for some reason, second Thursday is always the move for you guys. No? All right, cool. Nope. All right, uh, social media. We are doing our best to increase the funnel. Um, I'm curious, did anyone come to this group via Facebook? I've been posting links in like the Python developers group and a couple other places. I think that might be an interesting place to get more members. Anybody? Yeah, well, you know, I just keep seeing new new members show up on the group, so I'm figuring that's where they came from because the Facebook group is chat. But yeah, we got a Twitter. I occasionally tweet. We've got a subreddit. May have been responsible for our very first Zoom meetings, uh, Zoom bombing. So <laughs> I'm still a little wary of that one. Uh, there's a couple people in the Facebook group. Um, feel free to join. At this point, you know, there's not a lot going on, but. I figure if we build it and people show up, then, you know, we turn it into something. And then the uh, same goes with the uh, Facebook page. A couple of people on that. I think we got 26 likes now coming up in the world. Uh, SACTEC was, or sorry, SACPI was founded by uh, Josh Miller a number of years back. I believe it was about three years ago, uh, back in 2017. Uh, he handed the group off. Oh, wait, Tim wants me to go back to the uh, Discord link real quick. All right, there you go, Tim. I don't know if you guys can hear me. It's saying my internet connection is stumbling. Okay, pilot for the for the save. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, uh, Josh started this uh, a number of years back, and that's uh, supposed to be a uh, five. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Josh, anyway, uh, he he founded this a uh, number of years back. Uh, this was an in person event first when I started going uh, in October of last year. Uh, we were meeting at uh, Urban Hive in um, in Sacramento, but we obviously moved to Zoom due to COVID. And frankly, I'm uh, kind of enjoying it. Although I do look forward to seeing you guys in person in the future. Um, I was trying to do some stuff with OBS tonight, but you know, uh, Zoom's pretty good. So tonight we're just Zoom and YouTube. Uh, I'll I'll get the link up to this in the in both of the chats and on the meetup uh, afterward. Um, so uh, thanks for joining guys. Um, I, we did, a, we did a, a group photo last month. Uh, I'm hoping maybe you guys got the memo. I, I asked people to show up with their COVID masks. So if you can, take a moment. Wait, am I back? I got kicked out. Who's the host? Anyway, I'll go back to sharing here. <laughs> yeah, so can you guys hear me? Can anyone hear me? I have no idea if my internet is working. Yes. Yes. Okay, and it's yes. coming through okay? Great, great. Okay, great. So if you got a minute, <laughs> throw, on your, throw on your mask. I'll, I'll do a couple of screenshots here real quick, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing just so I can, like, look at each other, each person. Hey, why can't I, like, look at, oh, there we go, cool. All right, oh, Cliff made it. Hey, how's it going, Cliff? Okay, the full screen, there we go, cool. All right, we got Cliff. All right, thanks, Cliff. There go. Oh, there, that's a better view. Oh, what is happening to my mouse? Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Just technical difficulties here. <laughs> uh, can everyone take a screenshot of yourself and put it in the uh, in the chat? This is awesome, though. Thank you so much.
I we can take a screenshot of the 16 people and then you have there. You're right. I'm loading it right now. I'm only seeing a handful of people though, sadly. I don't know if my uh, thing is not working. I keep it there for. Okay, guys, that, that's probably fine for now. Awesome. All right. Well, since we're at home, we can take the mask. Oh, my. I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. This is going crazy. Okay. So. All right. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Normally we have amazing internet here. I would have gone home otherwise. All right, let's get back into it. Um, all right, thank you all for participating in this month's uh, head, headshot. Let's get back to it. All right, so this month we are gonna be talking about ETLs. Uh, an ETL is short for, or rather an acronym for extract, transform, and load. And we're gonna be talking about that. Normally I introduce uh, another speaker, but it's all me tonight. So we'll just get straight to it. All right, guys, uh, my name is Woody. I run a little company that does almost nothing called Brazen Studios. I've been doing a little art project and a development project my Twitter handle, my SoundCloud handle, and my GitHub handle are all Frymatic. And I have like almost no idea what I'm doing with the thing, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so I've been trying to turn that into kind of a consulting type thing, kind of a production type thing. I don't know. But what I'm doing right now, oh no, my screen sharing is paused. Why is my screen sharing paused? New share. There we go. Oh no. All right, can you guys see the beginning of this slide now? It, it said I was paused. Cool. So why am I seeing that? Uh, yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm sorry. Snafu, as always, hide inspector, there we go. Cool, all right. So maybe we should. All right, guys, so extract, transform, and load. So um, I do a number of consulting type projects. Uh, most recently, I've been working in the solar space. I've been working with this company called Global Energy for the past month or two. Um, they are an installation kind of network. They work with installers. They do sales, they do marketing. Um, they're global in name. Well, this is the greatest one I've had yet. Uh, okay, let's get back to it. Uh, all right, anybody, where did I drop off there? I don't know if you guys can hear me. This is horrible. <laughs> Hello, did anybody hear me? I think you got disconnected for a second, Woody. Yeah, yeah, I definitely got disconnected. Uh, okay, I'm. That's the grave that did. Oh, Woody. Yeah. Are you in dialogue? I might as well be. Seems like I'm using like some sort of tin can string situation at the moment. Um, okay. All right, can you hear me? <laughs> Jesus. Well, anyway, yes. yeah, all right. So Global Energy, I work for these guys. Uh, I, I was doing sales at a firm that worked with them a number of months back. Uh, when I was uh, with the sales team, I, I did just straight up phone sales. And then I slowly moved into sales engineering and eventually became their chief information officer. 
Um, and then, you know, they were, we were just, they were struggling with, with COVID and all that, but these guys were established and I moved on from there and end up with these guys. And so they, they saw my IT, um, I, I won't say prowess, but you know, a couple moves here. Well, this is great. Um, okay, so maybe I can like get on Tether or something. Uh, can you hear me again? Yeah, you come right back. Okay, this is, this is really weird. I must be getting pushed off for... Um... You, you know, it may look funny, but if you call in, you might take the audio out of this bandwidth and make it easier to share your screen if the screen sharing is killing it. That's a good point. Okay. Great idea. Okay, so let's see. Turn off your video too. Good point. If you're presenting your desktop, you don't or a, a, a app, you don't really need the screen video. All right, I now have phone audio. How's that? Is that working? Yeah, but you had another good suggestion. If you turn off your video and just do the presentation, right? You, that's one less traffic thing yep. happening. Yep. Not that we don't, love to, not that we don't love to look at you, Woody. Don't, don't get us wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you, we yeah, we already took pictures anyway, so you know those last way longer. All right, so uh, does everyone see the presentation yet? No, that can't possibly be. There we go. All right, uh, everyone sees global energy now. That's mm -hmm. good. Yep. Uh, okay, great. All right, so uh, rewinding, uh, I started with these guys uh, two months ago, month and a half, something like that. Um, they sell solar. They install solar, they install a number of other home solutions like roofs, turns out that pairs up with solar pretty nicely. They do windows, other things. Um, but uh, so yeah, I got here and showed up and basically said like, hey, you don't have to pay me right away. We'll figure out what value I can create, but what do you got for me? And so they showed up with this. Their first project for me, they had this file, masterlist.csv. It was just some mystery file. I don't know how long they'd had it. Uh, the co-founder who was the kind of CTO guy, just you know, running all their IT, he just kind of gave up on it. And he's like, yeah, this thing, I don't know what to do with it. Because it was a 1.63 gigabyte, which was more than like most you know, retail applications could handle when it came to roads but i figured it looked like a pretty good data science project and it was it was one i knew something about because uh back in the, my video game days I, I once worked in a marketing department and, and the guy came in and worked on a project across the across the table from me it looked kind of like a paint but it also sounded pretty neat he was helping them with all their emails and they had emails everywhere and they wanted to centralize them so he was doing what was called a um an ETL. So if you guys can see this diagram, I, I think the lines might be a little faint. I'm sorry about this. I, I just stole it from Wikipedia. But if you look closely, uh, there's a pretty simple flow to this. It shows two paths because the idea is that more often than not, when you're doing an ETL for a company, you're going to be getting data for from a number of different sources. 
and you're trying to get that all into a single source at the end. But as we all know, uh, when it comes to creating, say, uh, spreadsheets and then creating similar spreadsheets later, and those similar spreadsheets are capturing similar data, and then you realize, oh, I want to combine these things, often you'll find that those things are not structured the same way. Uh, you've captured some data somewhere, so didn't capture other data other places, but when you want to get it into that end system, you've got to do something in the middle to figure to to make sure that thing is all uniform. So you extract the E and the acronym, extract from your sources, you transform that into a, a properly shaped data structure, and then you load it into the, the target system. So uh, that master list that I had, uh, we, we started out with uh, the first methods that our guy attempted, which was, you know, open it up in the garden variety spreadsheet program. And as it turns out, Excel had some limits, a uh, million rows, Apple numbers, same exact thing. Google Sheets, well, of course they chose to be a little bit different. Maybe there's some good, uh, good like software reasons, but they, they chose a limit of 5 million cells. So I guess you can have really long or really, really wide spreadsheets or something. But basically like none of them were of any use to me with respect to that master list. Um, so that would be the first bit of transforming we would need to do. So uh, my first instinct was, well, Sublime Tech seems pretty nice and lightweight, so maybe that would help, help. and it did. And I found that this master list.csv had nearly 6.2 million rows, which is, that's a pretty good size file. Even with a brand new computer and pretty good text editor, that thing doesn't scroll very smoothly. Uh, once it was open, I also saw there were a bunch of null fields. Um, almost didn't matter what field it was, any given row could have a null. Uh, I also saw that there were street directions in some rows, and that's not driving directions, that's uh, north, east, south, west, that sort of thing. So. One, two, three, South Van Ness Street, or something like that. There were also apartments and units in some rows, and and some of rows, as I'm sure many of you are familiar when working with data, some of them were just bad. So um, there was definitely some work to be done. So looking at what I was trying to get this thing into ultimately, which was Salesforce. Uh, I, I needed to figure out like where the stopping points were. And this was another one that he had pointed out. When you get into their lead import thing, and these are leads for solar. It's a, this is a list of names and numbers and addresses. Uh, traditionally, you get emails and other bits of data, but this one was very, very stripped down. Uh, but with a, a file that large, uh, a web service like Salesforce, even if you know, established and sophisticated as it is, they had a maximum import uh, batch of 50,000, which I'm sure you can all do the math. If you've got 6.2 6 million leads and can only do 50,000 of them at a time, well, you know, you got to split it up. So when it came to splitting, I, I dug up some old Python projects from class and then I realized, oh wait, no, Google's way better. So it's GitHub. So I, I got on Google and I searched for CSV splitter and I found CSV splitter. And there's a link to that there. Um, it's a really short program. I think it was 50 lines or something like that. Very simple arguments. You can see at the bottom there, row limit, output name template, output path, keep headers. Uh, for anyone who's not uh, too up on Python, um, when you're when you're plugging in, when you're plugging things into functions, you have arguments, and those arguments often define the results you'd like to get. And sometimes there's a whole array of arguments that you can pass. And in this case. You know, we wanted to use the row limit to define, all right, this, these will be 50,000 or smaller files. Uh, output name template, you know, like 
is it going to be named? And then where should it end up? And then whether or not, you know, the key headers you should keep headers. But um, so I got to using CSV splitter. I load the thing up and unfortunately I don't have a screenshot, but basically it didn't work. It was it said there were some formatting issues. And I figured, you know, there's probably some good codified way to do this and I could do a round of research to figure it out and and do all of that. But I also realized that coming into this, I was a, I was capable of doing a lot of work that coders would do just because I work insanely fast. And, and I realized that code isn't always the answer because, well, sometimes it seems you can just point and click and then move on to the next step. But, so I was stuck. I had these broken up files, or I had this file. I needed much smaller files. And the file that I had was corrupted, so I couldn't use my little CSV splitter tool. So I figured, well, it opened in Sublime Text, so let's open it back up in Sublime Text. And the goal was just to get this thing down to a thing that would be handleable by uh, Apple numbers. I, I'm on a Macintosh. If you're, you know, you can have Excel on there too, and maybe you want to throw it in Google Sheets, whatever. But the point was I, I wanted to use with a tool that I had available to me and Sublime was working. So I figured I can just copy paste it. So I didn't have to do anything too fancy. Literally just open it up, copy paste, start a new file, cut things out and make sure you don't have too many, have any overlaps or anything like that. It was pretty straightforward. And then that got me ready for the next step, which was turning it into a proper CSV. Uh, I think I may uh, remember I was a corrupted CSV, and so I couldn't do the splitting. But the nice part about those, uh, you know, garden variety applications is they do a pretty good job of handling files. So I figured if I could, if I could paste a flat text file and then open it up in one of these and then export to a CSV, I'd get something that would actually be workable. So I had a whole bunch of dirty data, as I pointed out before. Um, street numbers were all over the place. Those street directions, the Northeast, Southwest, they were on some of them. Street names were in most of them. And then some of them, and this was the complicating factor. I'll explain that a little bit. Um, they had apartments and units in some of them. And that one was a messy one for a number of reasons. One, if you're doing a sorting project, you have four different columns to sort against. Then you have, or rather, if you have four different columns to sort against and there can be variation in the data in all of them, and you're trying to go through and, and, and concatenate things appropriately, as a four by four, it's like 16 different combinations of of data that you can work with. So if my goal output was a condensed read address, because that's what Salesforce had available, and then you know I wanted to discard any of the useless data and then have that thing in a proper CSV format, then you know, I, I'd want to make sure that it was as easy as possible, or I'd have to you know go back to scripting. So that brings us to Problem solving. All right, so this one's Violet's favorite. Whiteboarding. So I started with whiteboarding just to try to figure out what the heck I thought was going on. So you can see my awful handwriting here and why I like to type. Um, I figured if I had a source directory of a batch of CS these, and then I gave it a target directory to empty the new ones out into. I could then go through and iterate through that source directory, make a new file when it encounters uh, one of the files in the source directory, open the CSV from the source, read a line, do some parsing, and then write it to the new one. And then, you know, lather and repeat. Next thing you know, you've got a few files. And that was sounding like a pretty great headache, especially because of the apartment and unit thing. And I don't know if that like stands out just yet as far as like why are, why that's 
annoying or not, um, I recommend just trying it. I'll just talk about the solutions. But um, so that that brings me to the next um, problem solving uh, effort, which was pair programming. Uh, now, Robert is recently added to the uh, list of organizers for SACFI. He's presented with us. Uh, I've been working with him since the beginning of the year. Uh, for the past few months, we have been meeting on a regular basis, Tuesdays and Thursdays for 60 minutes. Uh, and we just sort of work on what we're working on. It's not always a project we're directly working on together, but we'll go through things and literally just look at it together and talk it out. Um, now. Is anyone not familiar with pair programming? Um, Maybe. Tell me about it. Catherine? Cool. Yeah. All right, Catherine. Uh, pair programming is uh, the software development uh, embodiment of this, the concept of two brains are better than one. Yep. Uh, and basically, the way it works is you can originally there'd be two people sitting side by side one person is the quote unquote driver that's the person that has their hands on the mouse and the keyboard and they're sitting directly in front of the screen and the other person just sits and is a an extra set of eyes and just thought processes and the driver does their best to explain what they're thinking uh, what problems they're running into and what they think they need to do next as they navigate through their code base. And then the person along with them, does anyone know the name of the other person, the passenger or something like that? Navigator? I don't know. Let's say navigator. The navigator acts as kind of air support. They Backseat they, driver. Backseat driver, there we go. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what it is because the backseat driver, uh, if you've been in any code classes, uh, I'm sure you know, is uh, usually the most capable of catching typos and things like that. And those are the sorts of things that can be just really annoying in programming that are just almost completely destroyed by having simply a separate, a second set of eyes. And Zoom makes it really easy to do that with uh, screen sharing. So say I want to, you know, look at a file, and you do the screen share, and then the other person can do it with you. Um, there's another, uh, there's a programming, or like a, a text editor, uh, inter, or what is it, interactive development environment called uh, Microsoft Code. They have a nice uh, sharing environment, which case, or in, in, in which you can highlight code and things like that. So not just looking at the screen, but you can actually like scroll around in the code. So, Basically, what it came down to is we were, I think it was Tuesday this week or something, talking it out um, what was going on. And I realized that what I had to do was approach the data structure. So when you're doing an ETL, you're, you're transforming the data. And often you're in a position where you don't have the opportunity to change the data structure. Uh, in place uh, in the destination. But in this case, I, I've been given a little bit of latitude so I can make changes in our Salesforce implementation. So instead of having to do this, uh, this data scrubbing task with four different columns of variability, I chop one of them off and it goes from something that takes me, you know, a pretty decent amount of uh, if else type trees and scripting to something I can basically do just point and click in a in a, um, a spreadsheet manager. And so if that wasn't clear what that was, uh, you can see here there's a, this is just a screenshot of uh, me and Apple members concatenating the, the street addresses. I'm taking the number, the blue column, the direction, that orange column, the street name, the purple column, and the uh, apartment unit, the brown column, and then smashing them together into a street address. But if I drop the need to add the unit, it becomes much simpler. Um, and then I don't have to write another script. I can just take 10 minutes on each file and be done with it. Uh, 
So here's kind of what it looks like. Uh, the master list is in blue. Uh, that was that 1.63 gigabyte, 6.2 million row file. I used Sublime Text to break it down into seven batches. And then I used the CSV splitter after I've done my data scrubbing to break it then, down then into those digestible batches of 50,000 rows or less each. And it comes out to about 124 different rows. And, you know, at that point, we're basically done with the transform. And with Salesforce, it gets kind of lame on the load because they have this thing called data loader. So I think I'll leave you guys at the, the bedroom door with data loader. And maybe I can talk about that a little bit more in the future. It turns out Salesforce is a pretty useful skill set. And, uh, well, I'm not done with this part, so I don't really have much to present. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if I could <laughs> summarize ETL, it's kind of sort of like this break stuff, break stuff down, clean it up, load it in. Pretty straightforward. Uh, all right. Well, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions and before we move on to announcements. So what do you guys got? So one of the things about the pair programming, it's good. I think this the person that's not got the key, got the keyboard at the moment, you know, besides typos and such, because the person that's coding is kind of talking through their rationale for things. <clears throat> the other person, because they've had different background, different experience, different techniques, may be able to suggest some improvements as they go along or look out or, or realize there, there, there's some gotchas. They might be you know, wrong level of indentation or, <clears throat> maybe uh, they're aware of a, of a library that can do something that, that the other person isn't. I mean, it, I think there's a phenomenal amount of value add um, by having that playing one off the other. You're not playing them off. You're, you're you know, incorporating the, the use of both. So, you know, one thing we want to think about is not think, think about other tools that might be available. Um, you know, if you have Unix, Linux available, which I mean, everybody can because it's free, right? I mean, there's a split command that would do exactly what you want to do up front, you know, splitting files into the, the arbitrary number of uh, lines and, and you give it a prefix and it'll number the, the well, actually it actually uses letters, um, you know, to name individual files afterwards. And there's some Windows equivalents to that. Um, now, of course, you can load WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and actually have access to the other commands. but you know, thinking about what other tools might be available um, so that you're not having to manually you know, process a lot of things. The other thing I want to point out, can you go back to your slide up near the front, the, where you're, the Wikipedia ETL thing? There you go. So your example or, or, or project, whatever, was to me a good example of, it's a non-trivial data set, right? Six and a half million rows. <laughs> Um, and it was messy, which typically data sets, as you say, or a lot of times when you're trying to bring them into a system can be messy, missing information, yeah. information, whatever. The one good thing you had was well, two things, I guess. Did, did you have any duplicates at all you had to deal with? Or if you did, letting Salesforce deal with them? Uh, you know, Salesforce has some functionality for dealing with it. I'm, I'm still working with some of the, the, the settings uh, right now. It, the default is either name or email and I don't have email and then, you know, name can have overlap. Right, right. Easy. You can have lots of, lots of dupes on that. Okay. Yeah. I'm not familiar with Salesforce's thing either, but so I just want to point out that that middle or, or actually the change detection slash slash snapshot is really, really critical because you know, this is an example of a what I would call a one-time transformation of load, right? Yeah. It's it's big big data set. It's messy, but once you're done, you're done. But yep. what, what we encounter a lot of times, and, and what this diagram is including, is hey, I usually have an initial fairly large load because I've been running these OLTP right online transaction processes, typical business systems. They've been running for years, and they've got all kinds of data and whatever. 
And now I've decided, you know what, I want to have on this data mart side, I want to have another view, right? I want to have whether it's a data warehouse, whether it's whatever, I'm going to, I'm going to probably summarize activity into to time buckets. I'm going to have different dimensions that I can then, you know, analyze them. So I want to bring all the data that I already have in, in a, in a known structured format. And that exactly kind of follows what you did. But then tomorrow or this weekend or whenever my, I consider my refresh period, I need to bring in anything new. And you know, the source of some data may be immutable, like I would say um, invoice uh, or inventory transactions, uh, cust you know, invoices to the extent they're posted and they can never change again. That's great. You can bring those in and you know they're never gonna change. Unfortunately, other objects you wanna bring in, and I certainly would include name and address, you know, kind of identity type information, it's gonna change over time. It's gonna morph over time. So you not only have to worry about I'm bringing in a new row, new record, I may need to bring in an update, right? So this whole snapshot change detection is to say, hey, what's new, what's changed? And, and of all of the fields or, or database columns that we're tracking, typically there's only a handful that are gonna drive that. It's not gonna be, you know, if I have 50 fields in this, chances are there's maybe three or five or seven that would indicate a change that I care about because really over in the data mart side, it's only going to be the fields that we are acting on. It's going to be like the dimensional fields that, that, that matter. But that's where it gets kind of ugly because if you think about it, you have to, if, if you take on the left-hand side of the diagram, that's the current data store and it's the future changes to it, right? It's data source. And then on the right side of the diagram, this is our new world that we're now going to be doing all the time to do all kinds of crazy analysis and stuff it needs to be complete i cannot miss any records but i only want one of each i can't just dump all the activity in there and, and have duplicate situate records over there so it just you know that that really that middle section there where you're determining again best situation is what Woody has, I got. It doesn't matter how big it is and how messy it is. When I conquer that thing, I'm done. I check that box and I go off to the next project. But sometimes you're going to run into situations where that's just the first step. The second thing is, how do I keep them in sync on an ongoing basis? So that, that's all. Yeah, absolutely. And, I can and tell that's you're the an expert step. on this stuff. Yeah, Cliff, you seem to know what's up. Uh, yeah, that's the next step, um, is uh, setting this up as kind of a linkage uh, and building out the lead gen aspect of things. And that becomes your OLTP. Like, that's, you know, people getting onto the website, they figure out they like the product, they want to know more, so they give us their information. And that's got to, as you say, come in and not get duplicated. I, I think I think Catherine um, had a really good point in that the the uh, the Python library that you initially tried using choked, but you don't know exactly why it choked, right? Yeah, it was something to do with the the format it was in, and I figured it was easier for me to just open it in the text editor that it worked in, copy paste and cut it up, and then open it up in one of those. I'm sure there's a much better way to do it. I'm sure. It's, yeah. You know, someone who was good could open it up and be like, oh, let's just add this line, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, so that brings up kind it. of a general problem is that when you have when you have dirty data, um, how how do you feel your way through it, right? How do you find where things are, are breaking when you try to use these automatic import tools? Um, and that's, I guess that's a a problem in itself. No, yeah, absolutely. Well, that and like once I had it split up, uh, Cliff, you were saying there's there's split functions in, in Linux, and I, I knew of of them, but I, I knew whatever I was cracking open here was going to be weird. So no matter what I did, once I had it split, I still had to go through and put up a whole bunch of eyeball time in. Seems to when you're playing with a data set, especially a really weird, crazy one that like 
a lot of times, especially in the beginning, it's not about finding the right answer. It's just about like seeing how your file responds to different stuff until you like weirdly develop a relationship with it. Like, you know, understand yeah. the, not just the actual shape of the data, but like the metaphorical shape, you know, like what is this thing you're working with? So, I mean, I can appreciate that. You found something that works, you know, you don't have to dig super deep once it works. You can, and that's great, but you know. Yeah, you Catherine, solution. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And, and I like that metaphor because you, you you really are kind of picking it up and looking at it from different directions and almost holistically kind of figuring out what's going on. Um, so one thing I've done in this sort of situation and, you know, sometimes the best thing is just to bring in, you know, a big chunk of it. I just bring it into Notepad++, which would be like sublime, I guess, and, and just look at it, right? And then also look at it and say, show me all the control, any control character, show me anything outside the classic ASCII normal set, right? So my, my low byte value and the high byte values, because I don't expect to see any other maybe carriage return line feed. And, you know, one of the things is if you, even though you had a lot of nulls and whatever, if you expected you had seven columns or eight columns or whatever, you could write a short script that just went through 100,000 of them or something or 50 or whatever, or maybe until it reached a certain number of exceptions, maybe 100. And anything that didn't meet what you expect to be the pattern, you could uh, output the line number and you could output you know, the text representation, the head representation if you wanted to, whatever, just to give you an idea of exceptions because you can kind of figure that you know, if, if it doesn't meet your definition of an exception, then you're okay. Likewise, the other thing I've run into is the wrong data types. You know, you have a date field and it doesn't contain a date. You have a numeric field. It doesn't contain numbers. It contains text or whatever. And, or again, control characters, typically not counting Unicode. Um, you know, we're, we're not usually going to be encountering control, you know, characters outside of the ASCII set. So I don't know. I, I just, when it's that many, you, it's really hard, I think, just to, you know, if it's 5,000 lines, you can almost load it into an editor and kind of just page down eyeball and kind of just look at things to get a feel. But again, it's when what Catherine said, it's getting familiar with that data, getting comfortable with what, what am I, and then and you start, you start in on, here's my expectation of a well formed data record. And whatever it, whatever in terms of that initial, pro, you know, how, how, how I'm going to deal with it. Cause I know that I'm going to be able to take that. I'm going to be able to do whatever I want to with it. In this case, you were combining the four fields into a well form street address, right? That you could then pass on to Salesforce. But if something didn't qualify or didn't match that pattern, then you really want to, I think, just take a look at a bunch of them and start to get a feel. Oh, this happens sometimes, this happens sometimes. And if you can actually pin that down, if there's really like seven exception conditions or three or whatever, then you can write a script that trapped for those make a decision. What am I gonna do? I, I see situations where for some reason um, you get shifts, right? If column five is always this and six is always that, sometimes six ends up being in five and, and five, if I go back further to the original data source, it turns out five was a null it still should have put an extra comma in there. It still shouldn't have moved it from six to five, but it did. And so that's another thing is, you know, what's my total? And of course, we're lucky here because they're not variable length record. Right? I mean, every record should have N columns in it. And usually if you're working CSV, that's the case. That makes it really hard then though, if, if it's okay that things are, are variable number fields, that sort of thing. Yep. I've definitely dealt with some data sets where things were just absolutely all over the place. Thankfully, this one wasn't that bad. Uh, all right. Any other questions on this one? Where did it come from? Where did that master file originate from? Uh, it came from one of the previous companies that, that the founders worked at. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do they have it uh, on the up and up? I don't know. Yeah, so when, but I know one of the can open them now. Yeah, one of the things I noticed, it, 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 just your little screenshot in the beginning, I think you showed us the last four records, right? 
And if you notice what looks to be the, the phone number field starting with 530 is in ascending. Yep. So it's almost like, you know, and, and maybe it's ascending within a city because in that case it's within Truckee, right? So maybe it's sorted, you know, that way or whatever, but it almost looks like, you know, years ago, okay, now I'm dating myself. Um, Years ago, you could buy these CD-ROMs, right, for different areas of the country, and it would include, like, all, all the addresses and phone numbers and whatever, and, you know, they had residential ones and business ones and whatever, but it's almost like it, it's a, a, a blanket vacuum, you know, set of contacts as of a certain date for the general, you know, greater SAC area. Obviously, Truckee's not in SAC, but still, if you think of it as a business area, metropolitan area, and then kind of going out X number of miles, it would definitely include that. And now that you're making us look at this, um, we know some of these phone numbers are going to be uh, business numbers uh, that are shared, but uh, maybe the phone number might be a place to start with the dedupe. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's a, a point of configuration within Salesforce. Uh, the defaults were name and email. So, you know, I'm kind of, kind of learning Salesforce as I go along. But I figure it's a pretty good one because it's a good ecosystem. Also, they have that big scary tower in San Francisco. Uh, it's probably a pretty good example for demonstration of the fact that they're going nowhere anytime soon. Oh, cool. All right. Anything else, guys? No, I think it was a great thing for you to do. Show us, Woody, because it's a real-world example of project that, that the company needed, right? And, you know, yep. you tend to think in terms of, oh, I'm, I'm going to be, like, designing and writing software all the time or whatever. A lot of times, no, it's a, it's a business need or a need, period. And it's, you know, this is what I need somebody to do, right? And so you... Like you got to be creative, and you were very creative, you know, on how you how you did this. So I have a question. Hey. Yep. Yeah. You know, let's stay with the kudos. That that's great. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with you, Cliff. This is really great that you showed this to us and got us to think about this, Woody. Um, but I, I have a question. We're talking about a flat input table, and we're talking about going to someplace like Salesforce that's going to have all of this relational capability. I'm wondering if um, if there was enough data in this master data file to decompose the table into some type of relational model. Possibly, I mean, it's it, it would basically be a single table. This is just the user's table. Okay. Um, but I think the nice part about once it's loaded into Salesforce is there's a, a number of options for slicing and dicing the data. I don't know if they do that in a traditionally relational fashion, but it's usually enough to make it good for a sales team or a marketing team. What's Violet showing us? Yeah, she's giving you a recommendation. Ooh, Python for data analysis. Noise. Somebody else pointed that book out to me too. So now I've got two yeah. recommendations. I'll have to get it. Blends in with the universe. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like what's data and what's just pure ether, you know? <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, all right. So we're going to be doing this again in about a month. Maybe we'll do it the first Thursday or something, figure it out. But uh, if anybody's interested in speaking, highly recommend it. Uh, I, I won't lie. I often use this platform to act as a forcing function for me to get my work done. That way I have something interesting to present on that usually has a business case associated with it. And, uh, and then I... I and force myself to finish a little sooner. <laughs> uh, everyone got the QR code that wants it. I'll post the link in there. All right. So, so as the co-host, I'm going to yes. solicit uh, ideas. And actually, I'm going to throw an idea out there of uh, MongoDB. Is there anyone who is really good with MongoDB and can do a presentation? Is it something that I want to learn? And it's something that 
comes up uh, in, in Python development, but I think most people tend to be more familiar with regular, you know, SQL databases. I'm not really good at it, but I've worked with it for what it's worth. <laughs> I like it. It makes me happy. It's nice to play with a, um, I, I enjoyed it. It's a good idea because it's something I know nothing about and that's kind of why I'm here. So uh, yeah, we would be that, super yeah. grateful if you do a presentation, Catherine. Okay, yeah, cool. I'll uh, spend a little time with it and like find a good way to compose something. Is there anything like in particular that people are interested in knowing? I mean, obviously I can show like how to load data into it and pull data out of it. Um, but is there like anything specific that you're like, oh, this would be a really great application for MongoDB and I just really want to see someone try this. Uh, so what platform do you use? Do you use Windows or Mac? Windows. Or Windows? So have you installed it on your Windows machine? Yeah. How hard is that? I wasn't too bad. I, I can't even remember okay. the process, so it must have been easy. <laughs> yeah, so that, like, that, that's a good starting point. It's just like, how do you go ahead and, and set it up? Um, um, and I'll think of questions and I'll send them send them to you um, after I thought about them. Um, I think okay. yeah, one thing for me, I don't know anything about it. I mean, I've heard of it, of course. But if you could kind of contrast the use case and or pros and cons, why would you use that versus a, a relational database? You know, what are, what are the advantages? And then obviously whatever you're showing would, would kind of underscore that or reinforce it, right? So like come up with some specific example so that I have something a little bit more substantial than like loading data in and out to be like, okay, well here I put together this little mini project that's like, here's, uh, that displays how it might be more useful for this kind of thing than that kind of yeah. thing. Okay. So, That'd be uh, wonderful. That'd be great. So for example, so uh, I work, work with the, uh, the Stripe API, right? Um, and so the Stripe API is variable in terms of like, it's like some sometimes you're gonna get certain fields and sometimes you're not. And I'm kind of assuming that uh, on their end, they're using a, a, a no SQL system like MongoDB. And that's why it has this um, variable structure to the, to the output. Um, so, maybe in terms of, so when you're working with an API like that, uh, how can you use MongoDB to be better able to, um, to map fields? Okay, so it sounds like you're making a request specifically to see how to load some API data into MongoDB and, yeah. uh, and also like using the fact that fields are structured differently, um, you know, with the API. Okay, that makes sense. All right, cool. I can do that. I'll, I'll put together a little something. I'll draw on um, one other project I work on. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, cool. Great, thank you. And Dan's got something in the, in the chat about uh, single board computers. Yeah, if I didn't ask questions more on the hardware side, but if you remember a couple of years ago, I presented about the um, monitoring system I built for irrigation in my garden. And I run that on a Raspberry Pi um, Python and it's outside. And I find that during the heat of the summer, it tends to um, I need to reboot it quite often, the Raspberry Pi. And it could be the heat, could also be just because you're riding back and forth to the SD cards. So I was wondering if anybody has experience with uh, single board computers that can run Python. Uh, IOS that has uh, flash on board and uh, can run on the industrial temperature range. And that's not like super, super expensive. So I think I need something with better temperature range and uh, just better uh, memory than an SD card. It's, and if you have any ideas, 
it's usually not the board rather than the heat transfer that the board is in the fans the cooling ability heat sinks and stuff like that i've done a lot of heat designs for products and and yeah you might be able to find a board that doesn't require a fan but it's going to be way out of your price range so you could take a raspberry pi and apply proper cooling techniques stick it in a box put a fan that blows air in and out etc and it still might not because it's a cheap little you know yeah. consumer device survive but it'll be improved at least and also maybe under clock it because the faster the clock goes the higher the heat of the cpu yeah i'm not i'm not running very fast at all there's really no need for fast clocking and i think the raspberry pi is really a like little temperature grade zero to 70 and i'm just looking for this more industrial temperature range i think yeah, and put a thermistor or a temperature sensor in there. They're really cheap. And then you can hook that up to the Raspberry Pi. And you can see if it's getting hot. And then you'll know that's the problem. Because yeah. if it's not getting hot, then you've got some other problem to do with it. And, you know, it, it's still, I still have to boot it every week, even when it's cooler out. So I think part of it is just because I write back and forth to the SD card. And I think that it gets corrupted. So I think a board with the on on board EMMC flash may work actually a little better too. Actually, have with that. I've actually yeah. I've accidentally destroyed a micro SD card in a in a Raspberry Pi because I was running a Postgres data database off of it. <laughs> yeah. My solution was to uh, move the database remotely and have the Raspberry Pi not do anything on on the hard di on the disk on the SD card and have it all send over the over the wire or over the air and store it in the database on on a server that can actually handle that kind of data mm -hmm. that, that kind of writing that's a really good idea could dan can you do that do you, does that you have one of the ones that supports wi-fi yeah i've got wi-fi out in the garden so that's that's no problem i'm i'm thinking about it actually going to laura laura huh. so that um i just send the data up to the cloud and then manipulate the data in the cloud. And that's, uh, um, and those low res are usually rated for outdoor use as well. So I, I that's, a, that's, uh, good, that's a good option. At this point, like you, you don't know if your, if your SD card is gonna like permanently stop working. So I think the better that you can get onto a new SD card, the better. Yeah. Move the operating system and whatever important files you have on there before it's too late. Okay. I love yeah. that the slight like distant panic in your voice. Like clearly you've had some experience. <laughs> <laughs> Save yourself. The database was awesome. I moved the database and all like I, I had my code in GitHub. I had the database moved off before it was too late. So <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got all the code. And I'd rather stay with Python because I and uh, like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, type structure because I really don't want to have to rewrite everything. But um, doing some really simple manipulation in the box that's outside and just send all the data up to the cloud and do it there. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for everybody's input. I appreciate that's it. That's cool. Yeah, that's great. I, I love where the conversation goes at this point in these meetups. It's always interesting. Uh, all right, so let's see. Any other requests for speaker uh, or like speaker topics? Robert re requested uh, TensorFlow earlier. I, I would love to request that myself. If if no one knows anything about it, maybe I'll just start working on it just to figure something out. I wouldn't mind seeing some stuff on machine learning. I'm, you know, I, I'm starting myself kind of like a little independent project to do a small machine learning thing. At least I think it's small. It's kind of hard for me to tell. Um, so basically, I'm playing around with multiply imputing data. If I'm learning to multiply impute stuff, then using Markov chains and like, you know, what people usually do for multiple imputation. Um, 
but I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just kind of figuring out as I go. So if somebody knows about that, like, you know, share your wisdom. That sounds interesting. Um, in the one thing that I did with machine learning was on Kaggle, and then I think it involved pandas. Yeah. And another yeah. recommendation from Violet. Oh, well, cool. Sick. Hang on, I'm going to type it up in my little notepad, scratch pad. But yeah, pandas kind of relates to what we talked about today. Maybe on, in terms of large data sets, munging large data sets, and 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 you know, getting them to the point where then maybe you can use TensorFlow, so starting from some of the fundamentals and then maybe moving up to machine learning applications. Well, I have one interesting way that one could use machine learning with a data set that uh, similar to one I use or for today's presentation. Um, when you've got all these leads in a sales system and say you've got a team of people dialing those leads, uh, you want to give them batches of leads in blocks that are manageable. If you give them too few, it doesn't feel like enough work. If you give them too many, it feels too daunting. Uh, if you give them the wrong leads, they don't get many pickups or many deals. But if you give them the right leads, you win. And so I think machine learning has a, a, a like an endpoint into that whole process with targeting. Um, and I, I think it's maybe not this open-ended thing. It's it's a somewhat scaffolded uh, process. But there's this funny thing with solar. Um, it's just about electricity and people are on power grids and power grids have Twitter handles and on their Twitter handles, they talk about when there will be blackouts. And so if you can get the Twitter handle of a power grid and recognize that they are about to have a blackout or they just had a blackout, then you can pick addresses that are within that jurisdiction and give those bleeds to the dialers to dial that day. So I think maybe that's where you do it. You do your little the, the data analysis there, but but you do it when when you're picking leads or something. The, the who's hurting today approach. Yeah, I'll let you know how that one goes. We'll get there eventually. I like that Coder was driving it the whole time. Yeah, I'm uh, going okay, uh, all right, so I switched this slide. Yeah, LA, nice. Hey, that's a good way to kill some time. Yeah, I've, I've been enjoying you guys talking. Sorry, I've been like driving, but. Hey, no worries, I love it. <laughs> I, I love jumping in on Zooms when I'm moving around. Robert, Robert will be like, wait, what are you doing right now? I'm like, I'm on a bike ride. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's a moving target, all right. Uh, okay, I put another slide up for the mailing list. I don't even know what we're doing with that, but we're just collecting emails at this point. I think right now, all we have is a calendar event with some of you on it. So if you want to sign up for that, Please do. Uh, but all right, we'll start getting towards the end of the program here because it was uh, just a one speaker evening. Uh, any announcements? We'll open the floor to announcements. HashiConf is next week and it's online and it's free. Apache? Oh, excellent. Yeah, oh, cool. I have it up here the uh, 12th through the 15th, but the 12th and 13th are all, I uh, know what is all open. You know, anyone can go and it's free and 
Ansible Fest uh, is the 13th and 14th next week. Right. Also. also online and also uh, free. Are there links to stuff? Um, yeah, I would uh, duck, duck, go since, you know, I like privacy and I would type in Ansible Fest uh, October 2020 or I type in HashiConf uh, October 2020. <laughs> Uh, and I just um, registered through those. I'm probably going to go, I'm definitely going to HashiConf. I might not do Ansible Fest just because I've already got two days booked for HashiConf, but I use both of those tools uh, all the time. So, Cool. Hmm. All right. Well, anyone else got anything else they want to bring up? Uh, if you got a random uh, presentation, yeah, feel free to drop in. Who is everybody on Slack? I assume that, uh, so I grabbed the Slack, Slack links when you put them up, but I did it like super fast and didn't join them yet or anything. I assume that folks on here are going to be on there. So like, what's your usernames and stuff? Uh, I'm on there all the time. I'm Woody. Let's see what I am on it. Um, Oh, but on the brazen one, I'm phragmatic. I'm gonna just like type, I mean, mine is just my name, I think. So like, it's not exciting, um, but I'm just gonna type mine in the chat. And if y'all wanna drop yours in the chat, then go for it. And if not, that's cool too. And then I'll, you know, I'll do my best to remember you and say hi in passing and whatever else, you know? Perfect. Yeah, the more usage of the Slack, the better, I think, and the Discord, either way. All right. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, it's been another good one. Uh, we'll, I will update the group and the Slack and the meetup and all that uh, when the next one's going down. For now, it's going to be the second week of next, next, uh, next month. But uh, I'll keep you guys posted. Thanks everyone for coming. Good seeing everyone tonight. Good. See, See you all in a month. Yeah.